got it. Here we go. By the way, Jacob, is Teeny Tiny coming in or not even coming in? Oh, yeah, she can she can make an appearance. Yeah, okay. Bring the horses in. A little something different. Bring the horses are coming in now. There's a... There they are. There's uh, Lady Treasure. And, you know, I, I hate to have a favorite. Sean, the other one. I'm sorry. Yes, Professor Nibbles. I... I can't... Well, I'm, thank you. Thank you. Put the microphone in a little closer for Teeny. We can see... Oh, oh! With the Mariners guy. We might have an issue going on here. What seems to be the... Problem. The sticky stuff police has pulled him over a routine inspection. Oh dear. But they are taking his glove away. That's what I'm afraid of. Uh oh. Oh, Tommy. <laughs> All right. made national news. Yes, it did. Team was right there with it the whole time. Uh, we're gonna do a little something different. So June 30th comes around, and uh, the governor is going to release all of us uh, from the lockdown and from everything else, and we are free to live our lives. And I had suggested a couple of m- about a month ago, I said, Jacob or to Brian, why don't we do this something where we look look back? We'll take all the news as it's breaking real time, then the host uh, from Cover Radio responding to the news as it breaks, and then we have some distance, then our sort of reflection on those stories now that we've got time and distance and space and we have a better idea of what's happening. So uh, we, uh, or Jacob, has put it all together. So we're going to do things differently. We're going to take us back to, I think it's either January 20th or the 21st, as the news breaks about Washington State having the first case of COVID. So three parts. The news story the host responding to the news story, and then the distance that we have with time and the host being able to look back on all of our all of the stories and all of the hosts here at Cairo. Let's get started. This is the news that broke yesterday. Ursula came in with it. Uh, in the United States, first known case of uh, Wuhan, uh, what do they call it, a cor- coronavirus? Coronavirus. Virus, yeah. Um, the beer, corona. <laughs> okay. We're very comfortable that this patient is isolated, poses a very little risk to staff or the general public in his current situation. It's named because there's a little crown. It looks like a crown that the actual bacteria does. Okay, now see, you just taught me something. I had no idea about that. (laughs) Ursula, did you know that? No, but I'm starting to wonder if I have coronavirus. (laughs) I had to step out. I have been fighting this cough. When I listened back to that, I think... Man, we were clueless. Yeah. I mean, marveling at the, it, it looks like a crown. We had no idea what we had ahead of us. Uh, I, I was a little nervous about it, but I certainly had no idea what a, a life-changing event this was going to turn out to be for you know individuals who, who lost loved ones and for people who lost their businesses or their jobs, uh, people who lost so many freedoms. Uh, it, I, I had no clue that it was going to be uh, one of the more life-changing events of our lifetime. Well, I don't know if you guessed because I, I write five commentaries a week, and back in February I was writing that uh, based on what we know now, uh, this is very contagious. But it looks less serious than the flu. And the the main problem was the reason everybody was worried was because we have a vaccine for the flu, but uh, not for this. So I wasn't really worried at all. And the medical community was pretty casual about it, too. We talked with uh, Dr. Jay Cook, who's the chief medical officer of Providence Regional Medical Center, on how to figure out if you have a common cold or the coronavirus. Here's what he said. Today, those samples that are taken have to be transported to the CDC headquarters in Atlanta to to be tested. So, you know, they're certainly not recommending testing everyone that, you know, just has the sniffles or, or a sneeze. That's the thing. It could change tomorrow. They are most concerned about the elderly, like those at the Life Care Center nursing home. Carmen Gray's mother, Susan Haley, is under quarantine at the facility. You asked for your mother to be tested for coronavirus. What did they tell you? That she did not meet the criteria at this time. They're being held hostage in a petri dish. The 12th U.S. death was announced. Eight are connected to this nursing home in Kirkland. My mother, I got a phone call this morning that she passed at 3.30 in the morning. I think somebody somewhere decided that this population of people wasn't worth using, wasn't worth wasting resources on. There is no quarantine. There is no process. It's getting worse. It's not getting better. It's actually my uh, father uh, who is in an assisted living facility. He's been there since last August. As it turns out, I found out yesterday that uh, two patients uh, at that 
at home mm -hmm. have now tested positive. Now, Governor, that's not a certainty, but it's a hope. If it's been spreading for six, seven weeks, uh, wouldn't the prudent thing to do would be to start talking about closures of, of public events and schools and, and, and really taking seriously the quarantining efforts? Uh, yes, we are starting to consider that and have been now for some period of time. Chef and I had someone come in from the University of Washington to come into the studio to talk about uh, the coronavirus. This is in early March. And finally, I said to him, I said, so scale of one to 10, how concerned are you about this coronavirus? And it was the energy and the way he looked at me when he answered. And when he gave an eight, it was that day that I took the coronavirus, which we call COVID now. It was that day that I called. I said, this is serious. And, and by the way, if there's one thing that I think outside of people's health, outside of people's businesses, outside of the 600,000 uh, Americans that we lost in this country due to COVID, I think people being separated from their families probably, in my opinion, was probably the toughest thing that we had to endure. I agree. That population was hit really the hardest. And at a time when you don't want to be isolated, they were more isolated than ever. My dad is very much a people person, and he could not see his family. Even now, they're not fully allowing us to go visit. So luckily, my dad has survived these months, and he has been able to overcome so many of the things that have happened during COVID while staying in an assisted living facility. But we still can't have full access. They, they don't eat together. They still don't eat in the lunchroom. They have to eat by themselves. He's alone in a room. And that is lonely. Hmm. How about that, Tom? First bit of sound is me mispronouncing it. <laughs> no, you weren't <laughs> mispronouncing it. You weren't. You didn't know how to pronounce it. You... Yeah, I think this is. A sl I think Jacob's setting us yeah, up. I think he's yeah. going to mock us throughout this. No, no, I just show. It just shows you how fresh that was. Coronavirus. We can't even imagine not being able to pronounce it. But at the time, right. that's a lot of syllables you've never uh, put it together. Um, yeah, yeah. It it does. I love these kinds of things because they're like little time travel. Yes, machines. they are. <laughs> sort of go back. I re so to me, the 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 kickoff was the very first case in Washington State, first time anybody in the United States had been diagnosed. And I remember that moment. I still have the uh, the newsroom in me enough that I remember thinking, "Oh, good. There's a local angle to a yeah. national or international story." You yeah. know, you're always looking for how can I localize? Oh my God, it's in our own. And I remember being relieved, like. I had no emotional connection because he he checked himself in. He had been in. Johnny checked himself in. They checked him out, and he was seemed fine, and he was released in right. 10 days. And I thought, okay, that's, that's how distanced the whole thing felt to me. And it wasn't until, I think, the NBA abruptly stopped a game mid-game. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> that I realized... Oh, this is going to have ripple effects like nobody's business. That's right. what that's what I remember uh, really being struck by. And then, of course, the the awful uh, series of one after the other of the other deaths in the uh, the uh, uh, local uh, nursing home. Yeah. How about we you? We hadn't been. We had never experienced uh, of something that starts so small that the ripples. Because normally news goes this way, right? News is if think about a pond. You throw a rock in, and then there's this big you know, sort of movement of the, the rings of energy going yeah. out from that, right? And then there's all the little ripples that you cover the rest of the story, right? Yeah, that weaken. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, terrorists, Islamic terrorists flying into yeah. the buildings, right? And then it's all of the, then this and then this. And, and then you dig into the stories and start to find the personal stories behind the gigantic story. Bridges mm -hmm. collapses and things like this. But for this, it was one and then four, and then eight. And then it, mm -hmm. the news became a series of numbers, right? And as they, the old yeah. line was, one is a tragedy, two is a statistic. And then all of a sudden, it starts to move further and further out, where it gets so big, and the numbers are trying to, like, explain it and what it means. And then you're always sort of extrapolating out from the number, well, how will it affect you, and what will it be the next thing that will occur? But to, to listen to us hear the news story, because it mm -hmm. does. It's, well, oh, it's one. Because we don't mm -hmm. know if it was one, and I think I even made a joke on the air. So which one would be us? Be the first one to get it, right? Remember that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 
And like Jacob and you didn't were, put that in there. Thank you, Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> you were rooting for yourself. I remember you wanted to get a. I think I wanted to get, to get it, it from. I think I wanted to get it from Sully. I was hoping. You also, get it, it was. It, yes. <laughs> it was. It was amusing to me. I. I it, it just shows you how far we've come. Colleen is kind of complaining to the governor about how come we don't quarantine already? Because there's been this constant complaint about why are we under the lockdown? It's fascinating to me that we were there was pressure on him before him saying, listen, you know, this has been going on for six to eight weeks. Why aren't we acting, you know, more seriously about a lockdown? Yeah, uh, right. And then all of a sudden that was the next thing. If, if it is spreading, what will we do to stop the spread of it? We w- knew <clears throat> what we knew at that point was it was in nursing homes, right? We knew that, yeah. but we didn't know much more than that. And then the lockdown came, and I remember all of a sudden there was this feeling, because you had seen, and people have looked at it saying, well, even before the lockdown, people were sort of locking themselves down. They weren't going out to restaurants. They weren't going out into crowds. They were sort of taking steps on their own as yes. this thing began became more real for people, right, Tom? I remember you and the two of us talking about, are you still going into restaurants? And I said, yeah, I still am, you know, until they tell me not to. And right. we did as a way to support businesses because there's so much business that had been scared away. This is before any kind of a, a lockdown. Mm-hmm. Here is Inslee. This, so go back. This is the day when the lockdown is announced. Stay home, stay healthy order. Here we are. <laughs> Tonight, I am issuing a stay home order to fight this virus. This is Washington's stay home, stay healthy order. This includes a ban on all gatherings and closures of many businesses, unless those businesses are essential to the healthy functioning of our community or are able to let employees work remotely from home. Governor Jay Inslee, he ordered a statewide stay at home last night. And we're saying, what, two weeks is the total amount, and then we all get to go back, or no? Well, he said at least two weeks is what he said. He said at least two weeks. I want everyone to text in one word that you got from yesterday. What was your reaction? Got reaction. One word. 22 million Americans newly unemployed. It's going to keep getting worse from here. With all the buildup that we had... And all these uh, other states going before us saying, uh, this is what's going to happen, this is what's going to happen, I felt like there was a lack of urgency. He can extend this, and this could go on longer. I think there's a 50-50 chance that we see more than two weeks for this order. We could be headed to 1930s depression-type numbers. This is not optional anymore, right? right this right. is not like, well, I wanted to if I wanted to. I'm going to go to work. Because a lot of times, businesses were saying to people, if you can work from home, work from home. If you don't feel well, then, you know, don't come in. Nope, that's no longer an option for businesses that were giving people the option. Two weeks, you're at home. The strange thing about when the lockdown order first came down, my first thought was, wow, how is this going to impact these businesses? That's when I certainly recognize that this isn't just a health crisis. This is an economic crisis. I know there are some people downplaying it. I know there are some guys like John Curley back then saying, kiss me, lick me. This isn't a big deal. I want to catch it now and get it over with. Mm -hmm. But uh, he had no way of knowing. None of us knew. I realized when they started shutting down businesses that this was going to be a significant economic issue. But what we all hoped was that it was going to be to flatten the curve. And that's what they were telling us back then. Well, I was prepared for it to last maybe a month, maybe two months. And you certainly made it sound like it was a pretty serious thing. Well, one of the things I do remember at that time, I had this feel like a melancholy feeling. I remember thinking, oh, and we're heading into summer, which you know is my favorite season. I thought, I mean, the president said we're going to be open by Easter uh, I thought certainly by May. We were hearing those promises of by Easter, okay, then, or by 4th of July. And I was thinking, we have to be back to normal by summer, by June of 2020. That should be enough time, right? A couple of months. Shouldn't that be enough time? But I will say, as it went on and on and on, I found the working from home, for me anyway, was uh, was no big deal. You're seeing what's happening in other states and then you're wondering, well, why are we dragging our heels? If we were the first place that had it and we've got these numbers, why is it that we're doing it in the way that we do? There was just 
a lack of consistency all across the country. You know, for four weeks, we'll stop going to church, we'll stop going to restaurants and bars, you'll wear a mask, you'll wash your hands, we'll flatten the curve, and then we can start getting back to life as normal by summer. Summer of 2020. Now we're a year out from that, and we're still under an emergency order. The governor has not relinquished controls. Even when the CDC said we were at 70% vaccination, Jay Inslee said, no, we're at 68.2%. I still have control. And, And there were mixed messages from every level of government, and it was hard to wade through fact versus fiction. And so it began, and then I then started playing that drop over and over again. We got to pound it, pound it. We got to pound it. <laughs> the uh, best, the thing that stood out of, of that entire piece, yeah. Hannah on the air saying, "You know, I think there's a fifty-fifty chance it might go more than two weeks." Oh, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> uh, thoughts, Tom? Since uh, neither one of us were mentioned in that one, and why was that? Jake? <laughs> yeah. you didn't get any sound cuts so- in that one. Huh? We, you were you were in there early, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah, whenever. Fine. But yeah, you, you were mispronouncing were, something. I rather. <laughs> if now. you remember, Tom, the the day uh, Inslee announced that order, Tom dropped off the air for like fifteen minutes. It was right after Inslee got done, and so we didn't get to hear from him until uh, a little bit later. Oh, you were already at home, Tom. That was exciting. <laughs> Yeah, well, in fact, the decision to send us home, I remember talking to Mike Salk, and it was right after, uh, you know, I back in the good old days, John, we used to yeah. run Jay Inslee's press conferences and yeah. Donald Trump's press conferences from end to end. We're like half our show would be filled yeah. up. But I remember after the, maybe it was at this point, um, or, well, no, if I was already home, but that when Jay Inslee said, hey, listen, you know, this is this is serious business. If you are over 65 or you are, if you're over 60, you ought to be taking this seriously. I remember talking to Mike Salk in the hallway and saying, yeah, he says, listen, is this, are we, are we going to start taking this more seriously or not? I mean, what's the thinking? He said, well, yeah, we're going to practice on the 710 ESPN troops first. We're going to send them home, see if we can get the uh, system uh, working. And I think it was March, it was, it was right around St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, when, uh, when I was, uh, you know, then sent home. Uh, yeah, just in terms of a reaction, I think it's, I, I do remember that a lot of people. So two weeks. I don't think uh, any of us uh, really thought it was going to be only two weeks. I mean, that was the it was initial two weeks. But there were these the cards that I think the Trump administration put out that you know for two ten days or two weeks for something. But yeah. the assumption was yeah. it'd be longer. Uh, this idea, yeah, remember they said, oh, wouldn't it be nice if it would be done by Easter? I remember making the comment. This was in June. I, I said, remember you know, this. I Do you? I, go ahead. I know exactly what you're going to say. Okay. Go ahead. About, the, about summer, he's like, about the kids. He said, well, you know, the thing is, this, this makes sense to me. It seems okay. We just basically spring term, spring quarter, we were going to have to, you know, uh, sort of sacrifice the kids to school. And mm-hmm. then I assume over the next three months, certainly by the fall, if this, if our kids are still out of school in the fall, Holy heck! But I said, but I think this gives us a good three month ramp up, ramp up to making sure that everything will be resolved and the kids will be back in school. That was where my prediction was way, right. but way I think this is, off. I think the other thing is I should mark the time and the date. It's the only time yeah. where you and I agreed on something with this whole COVID thing. We both said I think it was off the air that they're slowly he's. He's going to make another announcement. And even Hannah said, what's happening is, if you notice, there's a pattern. Uh, I'm going to make an announcement. Oh, right. And it's going to be this. And it's sort of light. Right. And then there's yeah. going to, and then all of a sudden, boom, there'll be another one. So it's sort of mm-hmm. the, get you used to it a little bit. I'm going to take this away and that away. But then all of a sudden, yes. wham, oh, there's going to be more of it. And then more restrictions. There's always this sort of tiny wave met by a larger wave of uh, more lockdown, more uh, restrictions, uh, more rules and regulations. Big box stores were essential, but smaller stores that sold the exact same thing were not, could not open. Um, we, I think we were the only state where you couldn't go fishing. You could be in a boat, but you couldn't fish. So then all of a sudden you start to see these. You know, by the way, if you're building a public building as opposed to a private building, the public uh, construction could continue, but private construction couldn't. And right about then is when I started to lose my mind. Um, uh, right. And also, I saw yes. the destruction of the what? U.S. economy. And yeah. I thought to myself, well, that's the end of Donald. And then he'd have these ridiculous press conferences. Yes. And he ended up, you know, hanging himself. 
And Donald Trump, you're talking Donald about. Donald Trump, and the when president. it became yeah. super political, where all of a sudden, yeah. as Dory points out, 20 million jobs, 30 million jobs, and the, you take a, a thriving economy and just throw a switch and turn it off. And, yeah, and, then, I, and then, then all of a sudden, just everything stopped. Everything. And I, I, I think it also might have been the position of our show, because we had just moved to the afternoon, and, you know, right before this thing started. In fact, I think Gene Ursula, you know, they'd barely been on the air for more than a couple of weeks before this thing hit, and it changed all of our plans. But because we were playing press conferences of Jay Inslee and uh, Donald Trump so often, back-to-back, yeah. that by the time we got on the air, you were furious at Inslee, and I was furious at Trump, and we were both just furious about, what's going on here? Oh. <laughs> all right, Jacob, should we keep going, do mask, or take a break? What are you going to do? Oh boy, that's a tough call. Okay, let's let's run through the the mask one, and then uh, maybe we'll have to uh, react to it after. Isn't that exciting? Kids yeah. in broadcasting, okay. what you're hearing is a producer live on the air <laughs> yeah, making sorry. a critical <laughs> decision, and that and, uh, that's what you get. That's kind of phone radio. All right, here we go. You ready? This is the great mask debate, running four minutes and twenty seconds. Here we go. Today we are adopting a, an additional and new strategy regarding the use of facial coverings in the state of Washington. A public health order mandating the use of facial coverings across the state of Washington. Now you might remember it was uh, the Surgeon General said this to everybody, tweeted this one out. Seriously people, stop buying masks. They are not effective <laughs> in preventing general public from catching coronavirus. I kind of took a picture of myself and by the way, the mask that I put together is something that Lillian put together. It is a green bandana. You know, best we could, you know what I mean? That's just what we got. Here's what I believe is the proper role of government and that is get us all the information. Tell us why you think wearing masks is important. All of that. But then let us as free adults in a free land, let us make our own decisions. I've, I've, I mean, I've hammered away on this for the last three days. I think everybody should be wearing masks. If they were available, they're not. That's too bad. It's crazy. I hope we're prepared next time. But it's a lot easier not to spread the thing. I mean, if we're assuming everybody is sick, then we should all be wearing masks. I was all in with mitigation. I, I didn't have a problem with wearing masks. I was washing my hands like a maniac. And, and I thought, well, if this is what it's going to take to flatten the curve, then that's what I'll do. And pretty soon we all were wearing masks. And I was surprised uh, just to see in myself how quickly I was willing to adopt it. And it's it's amazing, amazing what, what peer pressure will do. When you start seeing everybody wearing a mask and you're in the grocery store dealing with not wearing a mask, You start feeling uh, naked. And so I'm getting ready to walk into this metropolitan market in Sammamish. Let me say that again. I'm getting ready to walk into a (laughs) metropolitan market in Sammamish with a mask on. Let's just get right down to it. You're saying that people were thinking you were going to rob that store. (laughs) (laughs) Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Real quick. Real quick. Real quick. Keep it a buck right here. These are these are things that we said off the air. <laughs> See, no. that's the thing. Yeah. In case it wasn't clear to anyone listening, I'm going to make it clear. That's what James. Said. <laughs> By the way, it was a great. I still got a picture of that too. I made sure I took a picture yeah. of me in that. And as a matter of fact, I still have that bandana because I'm going to keep it because that was the first mask that I ever had. I remember uh, traveling. Last summer, my wife and I took a, a flight to Montana for, and just to get away for a week. And that was the first time I flew while wearing a mask. And, and I didn't like that. But but we were all doing our part. The uh, CDC screwed that up, too, by saying that don't wear a mask. And Dr. Fauci had it wrong. Don't wear a mask. And then it was like, OK, yeah, wear a mask. There was so much confusion at the beginning. Ultimately, it turns out the mask was one of our best weapons. But then it just went on and on so much longer than I thought made any sense in the world. And we found out how uh, Anthony Fauci in in March of 2020 said masks aren't going to do anything. And then a couple of months later, oh, everyone should wear a mask. And then a couple of months after that, you should wear two masks, three masks. And they were all over the board. And, And none of it was based on any actual science or data. I wrote my Itsy Bisky, <laughs> I can't even say it, Itsy Bitsy Mass Bikini song, which was on June 29th, one year ago today. We can finally go out in the open. We can dance, we can drink and have fun. 
But before we go out with our nose and our mouth, there is just one more thing to put on. And it's our itsy bitsy teeny weeny very manly face bikini. That's the order we all must obey. You hang the thing from ear to ear, and when you look into the mirror, both your ears, they stick out all the way. And forever, that's how they will stay. And that's why people hate the government. Ole. All right. Wow, ukulele. Good job. Way to go, Dave Ross. <laughs> All right. Uh, in the remaining three minutes, Tom, um, first crack at the great mask debate. Well, the to me, the biggest surprise of this entire COVID um whatever it is, adventure, um, you know, there's all the, the 600,000 deaths and all the tragedy. The biggest surprise for me was the fact that there was a great mask debate. I was dumbfounded that there were so many people objecting to masks. I had no idea that I, this is part of that I couldn't predict. I was afraid that we it could be really awful and have lots of, uh, you know, deaths and all that. But I was just surprised at how politicized masks got uh, so to me the fact that there was even a debate seems surprising i i know everyone harps on the fact that oh they initially said you know masks aren't any good it was to preserve the uh masks for uh the health workers and all that but i didn't find it that confusing they explained it two weeks later they said well actually now we have supply this would be okay i didn't find that a problem and i was just surprised that it became masks became for a while there a symbol of oppression and everything else that i didn't see coming and i'm still kind of dumbfounded by it how about uh, it was seen as a uh, symbol of oppression, and then it was seen as a symbol of virtue. Uh, it switched. <laughs> okay. Or maybe it had always been when, when you didn't need it. I um, fought against them, still do. I think it. Uh, I when they started with this, and you hear Dory has mentioned twice, um, you know, lowering the, or what are they, flattening the curve. Flatten the curve. They, yeah. Right. They kept moving the go pulse on us. They kept yeah. changing what they wanted to do to finally, it was like, we want to protect and save, we want to save every life. I mean, you can't. But, um, yeah, the, the mask became the thing that you wore. Uh, and by not wearing it, it showed defiance and that you weren't believing. And, I again, I'm with Dory. They gave you the numbers they wanted to give you. And news followed along and pushed a narrative that benefited the uh, one particular political party over another. And that's no. a sad story. Uh, well, too bad, Tom. We're out of time. Here's Travis. <laughs> All right, here we go. By the way, if you're just tuning in, uh, we've decided to do a retrospect looking back uh, June 30th rolling in, and the governor will lift us and free us all from the restrictions that have been put in place by the government. I'm sorry, by the governor. Um, and th we have taken the sound starting from the day, I think January 20th, uh, 2020, where the news first broke. We're giving you opinions. We're giving you flashbacks of opinions and then get a chance to sort of have a little distance on some of these. So let's, this is from when the vaccine rolled out. Was this uh, warp speed? Are we looking at, um, this is Jacob, are we looking at October or November? Yeah, closer to November when the, the what is actually getting into people's arms. Oh, okay. After the election. Right. But it would be fascinating to see the first year that COVID-19 vaccine is available, how high a percentage of us are going to get it. Mm. At, by this point, it'll, we'll have looked at it in the, in the uh, your rear view mirror and it may be, you know, feel like ancient history uh, to us 18 months from now. But it might be through the roof. It might be like 90% of us uh, get it just because we realize how uh, scary it had been. I would say most people will go back to their old way of living. I was the first. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I'm <laughs> really excited about that. Um, I had a flu shot a couple months ago. It was very similar to that process. Uh, it didn't hurt. I was very happy about that. I hope that, that we get to a working vaccine quickly and that we can save lives and that people can um, go back to life as soon as possible. I would get the vaccine, although there have been some reports that just a reaction to the vaccine can knock you down for a day or two. But if it means you're going to avoid the long-term complications... I'll get it. First doses are set to ship 24 hours after FDA approval. That could be as soon as December 11th. Six months. Can you make it another six months, G? <laughs> you have no choice. <laughs> well, guys, I'm tired. I can't continue living 
like this. Ursula, remember how before I said that, no, you first on the vaccine? Mm -hmm. Yo, at this point, I've changed. Sign me up. Give it to me. Give it to me. Give it to me right now. The vaccine's going to run out, you know, for this first week. I mean, we had such limited doses. Middle-aged and younger adults, I think sometime uh, late spring, uh, late spring, everybody will be able to get it. You know, then it was the, with, with the rollout. Then it was like problems with the rollout. Then we're like fighting each other over who should get it first. None of it has been smooth. None of it. President-elect Joe Biden blasted the Trump administration for falling far short on its promise to get Americans vaccinated. The effort to distribute and administer the vaccine is not progressing as it should. It became, you'll remember, it was like the the Hunger Games. You couldn't get an appointment. And since I was uh, uh, working from home and happy to wear a mask, I didn't feel there was any particular need to uh, to try to game the system or spend hours on the phone or on the computer trying to get a spot. I figured it'd open up eventually because they're going to they're already manufacturing the vaccine. Right. Uh, of course, it was my kids who finally got me uh, an appointment, uh, although Colleen tried as well. You are trying, Dave, but you're unable to get yeah. an appointment. My because yeah. my, my daughter keeps sending me links. She says, try this, try this, try this. Every one of them goes to a dead end or they're all grayed yeah. out. You have to be computer savvy, have eight arms, and be, refre- you know, the high-speed internet to refresh and get on there. I'm not I'm not playing that game. It's, I'm not playing like, you know, the Rolling Stones concert here. I'm it really gonna... is a game. Well, finally, the uh, Biden administration got a vaccination program going, and we started seeing the uh, the vaccine flow. And I thought that was good news. But I said from the beginning, if you want people to get the vaccine... You don't line them up at a stadium. Uh, you don't um, uh, announce that there's going to be a vaccine for two hours uh, over here up in Marysville and then for three hours in Wenatchee. You, you send it to the local drugstore just like we do the flu vaccine. I was nervous of the vaccine in the beginning, but I was always going to get it. But by the time Ursula had asked me and if the FDA had did some passing of things and they're saying I had to wait another six months, I said, Mm-mm, let me get that thing now. I'm tired. Enough's enough. At the beginning, I thought there was no way we were going to have the vaccine as quickly as we did. And I think President Trump and Operation Warp Speed absolutely get credit for that. And it's too bad that we had become so divisive over, you know, over the years, but in particular now about COVID, that there were a lot of people who were going to doubt the vaccine. I thought it was incredible that we had a vaccine and I could not wait to get it. And initially, I thought I would be one of those that I'll wait for a little bit to see if it works. But I could not wait until I was able to get the shots. Uh, for kids now, for you know, twelve to seventeen year olds or twelve to twenty five year olds, uh, there's no question in my mind that the risk of the vaccine is much greater than the benefit it provides. And we've seen that, that there's been inflammation of the heart in healthy teenage boys. There's been deep vein thrombosis in uh, in some young people who have gotten the vaccine. So there, there's no blanket answer. And it makes me sick that our politicians and a lot of people in the media uh, have have just said that we should all get vaccinated. Because I think that's a bunch of nonsense, and I think the people who say that are just shilling for Pfizer and Moderna, who are using our children to keep their quarterly stock prices as high as possible. (laughs) Wow, Dory's got a lot of opinions. Yeah, there you go. Well, let me try shilling for Pfizer. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, that's one thing, Dory, that I just I think I disagree with. For 12 to 17 year olds, the risk of vaccine is greater than the uh, the benefit. The there are individual individuals who react badly to anything and everything. I mean, that's the nature of vaccines. And so, if they do know something about, okay, these are the kinds of kids that are susceptible, or this or that. Yes, I can imagine there may be instances where a 12 to 17 year old might uh, end up uh, suffering, you know, badly for it. And if there's any way to mitigate that, I think that's, you know, that's that, then I'm all for it. But I think mm-hmm. this idea that the vaccine itself, when it's 100 percent effective against COVID, the Pfizer uh, uh, stuff, it seems to me more safe than, you know, way more safe than not. 
Um, unless you don't think that COVID is at, at, at any risk, I wouldn't have a problem uh, as long as I, you know, checked out what what the individual aspects were. Because, I mean, you could use that philosophy against any vaccine then. Because a lot of vaccines, um, they do have the, the rare instance. And if it's one mm-hmm. in a million or one in 10 million, um, is it worth it or not? You, you yeah. mitigate the circumstances as best you can to see if you're susceptible. But anyway, yeah. Yep. I don't but think that makes point. me shilling for Pfizer, that's all. No, but at this point, we're okay. looking the perspective and looking back. By about this point, I had lost complete and absolute faith in both the government, social media, and, wow. and mainstream media. Uh, because well, I had seen... With the vaccine. Because that the was vaccine the With the vaccine and the, yeah. the narrative okay. of the news. No, listen, yeah. on the Time that's magazine, the cover of Time magazine should have been the vaccine. Yeah, okay. Right. No, it wasn't. It was so, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden. So, But my point at this point was... Um, I don't trust the government. I'm not turning into QAnon. Yeah. I don't trust them. I don't trust the media. Okay. I don't trust social media, which but is stopping vaccine. certain information from getting out. So um, you don't trust and the vaccine. Based, what, what, uh, it's, it's, it's level. It's um, it's at what section three or level three of being reduced, uh, released. Normally, there's the fourth, and then then the FDA rush this out. Listen, go ahead and get wow. it if you if okay. you're running the if you if you're seriously concerned. For your health, and you believe this is a you want to take the vaccine, take the vaccine, right? I don't, I don't like, I didn't think we want to get into a situation where the government is forcing you. I don't think they can do that. Uh, but at this point, such little amount of faith one in the narrative that was being pushed, and then two, the government and what they were trying to do with it as well. That at this, I was completely done, absolutely done, and. Isn't it interesting? And I don't want to get into like, is it isn't interesting? Now all of a sudden, oh, now you can talk about this. Now you can mention this. Now Wuhan possibly, yes, because Trump is out of there. And, and oh, the vaccine. Yesterday, Ron Johnson had a press conference. You won't find it on any mainstream media. And people have already said, oh, it's more conspiracy thing. There were four people that were sitting there. One of them was a 14-year-old and her mother. The another one was like a 25 or 35-year-old woman. And they were all having, they believe, some adverse reactions to the vaccine. And I thought, well, this is really interesting because if this was anything else, that 14 year old girl who's now in a wheelchair would be on 60 Minutes. I will be it will be interesting to me to see if news picks it up. Are you aware of Are you aware of Ron Johnson's press conference? I'm aware of Ron Johnson. The problem is he's so sullied his reputation for honesty and integrity that I think a lot of people are being doubly careful with whatever he's uh, spilling. So Uh I think Ron Johnson might be the problem. Oh, okay, so the woman and the 14-year-old girl that's in a wheelchair, that's not? No, I mean, if that, well, we'd have to see. If, if somebody a little well, more reputable see it, but it might, would, but the thing is would that sponsor Social them. media decided what you were allowed to hear and what you weren't allowed to. The Great Barrington uh, Declaration oh. blocked. <laughs> Tom, it's, listen, yeah. th- why not? Because it was misinformation. And by the time we had gotten to this point, it was like, okay, you okay. know what? I, I'm done. But, you, okay. but, but if you want to buy it hook, line, and sinker and follow Fauci and follow everybody else because that's the way you do it, then fine. But if other so people the, don't want to follow, that what bothered me was like, tell the, me who died. Tell me their age. Tell me their weight. Tell me the additional uh, information. They didn't. News this, deliberately, deliberately withheld information from us to have us all behave and act a certain way. This is the segment we're supposed to be talking about the good news, the vaccine has been universally heralded as one of the great you know, scientific breakthroughs in the history of medicine because yes. we figured it out so much. So I don't know why you're being so – the vaccine is a great thing. Now, if you individually don't want to take it or if Dory doesn't want no, to have it – No, I have it. I've got a vaccine card. I've got the vaccine card, Tom. I know, but, John, will you say will you say that you got the vaccine? I've got, all you got, say you got is, a little my, – my name's on there. i got the vaccine card. <laughs> I know. So well, do I have to I show know evidence? Like to be what co- card do you have that shows that. you? What do you have that shows you were vaccinated? I have a vaccination card, and it's legit. Okay. Right. And the question is: Is yours legit, or did yeah, you? Absolutely. As absolutely. you mentioned, it's that a you legitimate t- you... card. <laughs> Same thing as you, Tom. Same did you get a shot, John yeah, Curley? Yeah, did you get a, a vaccine shot? shot? I'm getting a shot right now. <laughs> Here's the shot for you. You Tom, and right Ron here. Johnson. <laughs> This is the, by the way, this is the uh, bourbon that you gave me. Ah! You, half, <laughs> the half empty one, right? Half empty. <laughs> That's right. Yes! I gave you a full gift certificate. <laughs> 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 yeah, so you didn't have to b- bother actually buying the gift. <laughs> that was a, yo, a, oh, wait a minute. Jacob, Jacob, as far as just general right. etiquette, yeah. 
I, yeah. I don't Dear know. Dear Ann Landers, I, do think I, have I to gave my the- friend a gift certificate. <laughs> my friend left me a half-drunken bottle of bourbon. Because the half-drunk sincerely of bourbon confused was, and slightly was, angry <laughs> was was a was a routine a shtick on our show for for weeks oh, until we yeah, right. until we found oh, out yeah, the old, that oh, our the old bosses might not be bourbon comfortable. Stick. Oh yeah! Oh, I didn't realize it was a prop joke. Oh, okay. it was. Remember? I didn't that, that's and that's funny about that. <laughs> well, if you right. don't appreciate. Heritage oh. Distillery, then give it no. back. Oh. oh, my God. All right, Jacob, what do you do now? BSB. We've got one more package. Do uh, we have time? I, or, yeah, yes yeah, we no. got time. we got time for this. All right, this is uh, Hope. Hope. Hope's a dangerous thing. <laughs> Morgan Freeman, Shell Shack. Yeah, according to you. I started feeling hopeful uh, as soon as I got the vaccine and started hearing that all my friends got the vaccine, too. And then finally, enough of us had gotten the vaccine that we decided we're going to go and have lunch at one of these newly opened open air uh, restaurants. And uh, it was great. I forgot how much I had missed personal interaction. Uh, A turning point for the better, I don't remember any one particular thing because it has been such a slow baby step evolution. I think it had to have been, let me see, um, Was I had to have been before I got COVID. Uh, maybe it was after my first shot. So maybe this conversation happened around eight, beginning of April or something like that. And maybe I was talking then about how I do see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, I felt things could get back to normal. I thought they would get back to normal long before they did, because then we had that that second wave in December, and then things seemed to actually uh, go backwards, and I was resigned to uh, working from home and never going to a show again. I definitely started feeling a lot more hopeful around December. We were already hearing about when the vaccines would come out. Uh, I knew that it was going to happen soon, and there were going to be different options. Also, it seemed like hospitals were not over capacity, that we were seeing some plateauing. We were talking about getting school, uh, kids back in school in some cases. That dragged on too long as well. But I started seeing hope. I feel like now we are finally to the point where since I can now get those N95 masks easily myself for like less than two bucks uh, a mask, that the market has finally compensated i'm stocking up on them for when the uh what is it the delta the gamma the epsilon the variants come out so now i can wear a mask that will protect me while they come up with the uh the next vaccine and i will uh live as normal a life as possible and keep the economy going this time and my mind is always glass half full anyway so i'm always looking at you know what's better what's better my dad was getting great care. They no longer had active COVID cases in the long-term care facilities. It seemed like doctors were figuring out better. There were more options for treatment. People were surviving more. Those were all things that gave me hope. And then the vaccine. I mean, the vaccine was the biggest game changer. Absolutely. I, I did love getting rid of the mask. I guess the first time I went to the grocery store uh, about a month ago without a mask on, that was kind of my first step of freedom. That was that was me getting out of Shawshank and breathing the fresh air of freedom for the first time in a long time. Two Shawshank references. That was unplanned. (laughs) Shawshank. (laughs) Andy climbed through the worst half mile of the most foul-smelling thing. Uh, Well, we're not going to have any time for letters. But we do have time for Tom to say something about being hopeful. Yes. Well, I I mean, it was interesting to me that Dory doesn't remember a moment that it was like such a long struggle that there's no individual moments of hope. I remember when I was coming back from uh, Yakima after getting my second shot, I just felt fantastic. Now, um, my wife ended up getting uh, hit pretty hard, you know, like two days later. I had no reaction, but I remember thinking, wow, with this combined with my my 90-year-old mother getting her second shot, it was like, I really felt like that was, that we made it. Even if we had to, you know, hunker down for a Mm -hmm. lot longer uh, you know, for other people to catch up with us, we got it in March, I think, uh, the three of us, that that really felt like, 
wow, it felt very freeing that I had escaped from, you know, the the curse of COVID that even if I was going to have to live, you know, bunker style for a while, I was personally safe. My wife was safe. My kids in New York City had, had gotten their vaccines. They were safe. My mother. That made me feel very hopeful for our future. Mm, good for you. Uh, uh, you never felt it, huh? Well, I didn't ever felt threatened. Yes. Okay. Fair enough. Fair right. enough. I'm 55, 57, 58 years. I'm 58 years old. Uh, I have 8% body fat. I don't spend a lot. I wash my hands. Um, I'm not obese. I don't have a secondary condition. And my chances of dying of the thing, getting it, possibly, getting it and dying, eh, tiny, infinitesimal. So it wasn't like I was afraid of it. And uh, I don't know what good comes out of it. I don't know what okay. good. I don't know what fair happens enough. to the country. I don't know. But I never felt like my life was threatened. To, and to be fair, John, I felt that way, too. Personally, I didn't feel individually threatened. But because I uh, take care of my mother on the weekends and, oh, you know, yeah. it's like that that it was the threat to my mom that mm. I was most concerned about getting sick myself and passing oh, yeah. it to her. No, so, I'm s- sympathetic yeah. to that. Listen, if you yeah. got an older individual or somebody that's sick and they're overweight mm-hmm. and all that other stuff, it's like, yeah, then... You know, you're looking like, wow, am I next? The, the higher statistics, the greater chance of you getting it. All right, give me a little bit of Mailman song, please, Sean. If you heard the just enough, just enough, to, just as much as you can stand, just as much. I never thought it would always, it seems to be always, a little okay, shocked let's get to how to much it. you can stand. Here we go. <laughs> Uh, so the uh, the letters are, uh, we'll start with the COVID retrospective. We're, we're uh, just wrapping up here. Every Code 206 says, hey, thank you for doing the montage of breaking news. It's reminded me of everything that I've gone through the last 15 months, and it's bringing me chills and giving me goosebumps. It wow. was so surreal, and I had to figure out how to teach my students from my house, and I had no clue how to do it. Wow, uh, chills and goosebumps. Could You could be coming down with something. 253. <laughs> I bet my buddy in Texas, a uh, 12-pack of Corona beer next time we meet up if we'd never hear the word coronavirus again after the first week of April 2020. Oh, <laughs> oh how wrong we were. There you go, 206. John, I was yes. thinking maybe you forgot about that part where you could go fishing, but you couldn't be in a boat. No, I remember that. Uh, let's see. 206 says, is the mass song on the Facebook page or on YouTube? I need to listen again. I think that was the Dave Ross uh, reference. Mm-hmm. Eric 253, now that COVID restrictions are over, what are you guys going to talk about for 80% of the show? It's been so convenient. Time to get back to work. Yes, <laughs> good. Uh, Kip in Lake Bay says, thanks for doing this special program, guys. Well done. Exclamation point. Thank you, Jacob. And we always have smart Alex in our crowd. Area code 206C, just add some sparse piano and dramatic pauses, and you can make anything sound important. <laughs> okay, okay. You know what? Screw you, 206. <laughs> Heat Wave 206, the only restaurant I found to be open yesterday was a Mex- were Mexican restaurants. Aha. Uh-huh. Uh, area code 206, they were called Wing Windows. Oh, that's right. Uh, to cool yourself off. Mm-hmm. Uh, hey, what's this? Uh, do, do, do. He, hey, Curly, I'm not a mask guy, but my wife is wearing hers for allergies. Okay. There you go. Uh, area code 206. By Inslee's logic, if this heat wave was caused by global warming, then wouldn't it still be going and keep going? Mm, uh, Steve in Northgate says, with Jay Inslee's agenda on our state, we'll be drowning in taxes and the temperatures won't be any lower at all. Area code 206, the record temp in Washington of 118 degrees was set in 1961. What was causing that climate crisis? 253, uh, geologically, Florida is sinking 253. (laughs) Uh, um, The Alzheimer's and Medicare uh, story, area code 206, something you may not be aware of, there are over 125 different types of dementia. Alzheimer's Hmm. is one of the 125 plus kinds. Another factor is all dementia is progressive and all dementia is fatal. Hmm, two, five, three. And now we are all crying. A great guy. I think I know who that person is. Just great. Just yeah. great, yeah. Yes. We have a knack for that, John. Yes, uh, area code 253. I seem to remember texting you a, quote, terrible animal story of the week years ago. My own terrible story about old vampire mice getting young mice blood transfusions and then performing better in mazes. You read the letter on my birthday, October 15th, and it made my day. Thanks for the many years of great radio, Tom and Curly. <laughs> wow. Uh, I don't know if we're going or they're going. 360, yeah. Tom's government is all about creating and managing scarcity. I prefer abundance. Hey, and Eric Code 206, why is it so expensive? 
Yeah, the mm-hmm. Alzheimer's uh, thing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so. Talking about our um, MLB and our Mariners pitcher, Tom's government pen- penalizes me and all the uh, for all the time for following the rules. Why should the MLB be any different? Wow, well, Tom, they really they, they have you closely associated with the government. And now it is time for the letter of the day. And the letter of the day comes from area code 206. John, yeah. happy birthday from Houston. My family has been here for the past week and saw in my calendar that it's your birthday. Been listening to you guys since Brian, the first producer, was there. Happy oh. birthday. Hopefully it's the real one. <laughs> well, thank you. It's, it's, t- it's tomorrow, tomorrow, right? It's tomorrow. But that's all right. I'll take it early. <laughs> Celebrate early. Yeah. Um, by the way, I'm going to go to Brazil in August and have plastic surgery on my neck. No. That's all she wrote. That's all she wrote.